generational teacher. I think her mom, Michelle, is still here uh, participating in the workshop. Tonight, uh, Becca has a, a, an undergrad and graduate degree from the Department of Geography and Environmental Sustainability at OU. Her undergraduate thesis uh, won an award in the department for the best undergraduate research project and her master's thesis won an award at OU for being the best social studies master's thesis uh, at OU. For the last couple of years, um, well, for two years, she's been uh, the OKH project coordinator and then got promoted to the OKH project uh, director. I think everybody here knows her. Uh, we've been interacting with her, but doesn't know that stellar background that she has. We've had two BAFO presentations thus far, and I think Becca is going to back clean up and finish up uh, with another home run talking about integrating uh, the massacre and Greenwood using the five themes of geography. So I'll turn it over to Becca. It would help if I unmuted myself. <laughs> All right. So can everyone hear me? Okay. So uh, yeah, thank you, Scott, for that introduction. In my presentation, I'm going to first talk about some inter some differences between history and geography. Then I'm going to introduce the five themes of geography and finally apply the five themes uh, to the rise of Greenwood. The history presented here will be a reiteration of Professor Lansano's presentation, but the difference is I'll be tying it tying it into the history, um, tying it into geography. So during this presentation, I'm going to be asking you to type a lot of responses in the chat, so get ready to type. And at the end of this presentation, you'll find an appendix that includes the Oklahoma academic standards and the national geography standards that are covered, but I'm not going to go over them for you, but you'll have access to them later. So what's the difference between history and geography? Uh, type your response in the chat. It's okay, you can guess. Don't be shy, no wrong answers. And then after reviewing the chat, I'll talk about what I think the difference is and how that will frame this discussion. So Scott says time versus space, past events, current situations. History is a narrative, geography is a location. Okay, got some good answers rolling in. Yep. All right, so uh, you can still keep typing in the chat if you want, that would be great. Um, but then I'm gonna move on to the next slide. Yeah, these are all really great responses. All right, so wait a minute. From this perspective, history and geography look exactly the same. Of course, we know both disciplines are very closely related and both seek to answer all of these important questions about the past and how to shape the present. But here's my take on what is more heavily emphasized in each discipline. In short, I think history is more about the when of who did what, where, and why, and geography is more about the why of where, who did what, and when. All right, so what was that? Here's a simpler version. So I think history is the when of what, and I think geography is the why of where. So we know these two disciplines are closely related, but how exactly is this? So yeah, lots of good responses still coming in the chat. Geography is a human experience. Yeah. History is the study of past people and events and geography is the study of how locations and how they are affected by people. Yeah. All right. So enter historical geography. So why don't you take a moment to read this paragraph and share what you think the focus of historical geography is. 
And just remember, there are no wrong answers. The aim here is to have a discussion so we can learn from each other. So don't be shy about typing in the chat. All right, so someone says history in terms of a narrative, stories. And history can vary widely depending on who the storytellers are. Yeah, that's a really good point. All right, so kind of while you're thinking about that, um, you can continue to type responses in the chat, but Here's my kind of too long didn't read version of this paragraph. So a static explanation of historical events is not really the main objective here, but rather we're going to examine the geography of a region or place, in this case, Tulsa, Oklahoma, as it was in a given past period of history, particularly in the years leading up to the Tulsa Race Massacre. Uh, as an aside, you will have access to all the sources used in this presentation once this is uploaded to the OKH website. So if you have any questions about anything that I'm pulling from, it's all going to be there once I upload this. So yeah, we had another response come in. So historical geography of landscape, location, and place change over time. Yeah. Great. All right, so how are we going to analyze the historical geography of Greenwood? We're going to use the five themes of geography. Specifically in this presentation, we will use the five themes to understand the historical geography behind the rise of the Greenwood District in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So can anyone name any of the five themes of geography? Type your answer in the chat. Don't Google it because I know everyone could just Google it and then copy and paste. Place, location, region, human environment interaction. Okay. There's one more. Movement, yep. All right, see you guys are so good. All right, so yep, these are the five themes. An easy way to remember the five themes is with the acronym Mr. Help. So I've got it here in the acronym order. Um, I'm now going to briefly walk you through the five themes and then we'll apply these themes to understand the significance of Greenwood and Tulsa, Oklahoma. So for the purpose of this presentation, I'm not going to go over them in the same order as the acronym as some of the themes build upon each other. So simply put, location is a position on Earth's surface. Location can be relative or absolute. Uh, what do you think is an example of an absolute location? Type your answer in the chat. And what about a relative location? What do you think an example would be? And you can type that in the chat as well. So whenever I was looking at the registration, I noticed a few of our attendees are from Fort Gibson. So just as an example, Fort Gibson's absolute location would be 35 degrees north, 95 degrees west. Fort Gibson's relative location could be described as about nine miles northeast of Muskogee, Oklahoma. So yeah, we've got some responses in the chat, latitude and longitude for absolute, Yep, assign coordinates for absolute, yep. Yep, relative south of Tulsa, yep. Relative is in relation to another location, yeah. 
Yeah, so at a given position on Earth's surface, there are underlying geographical factors explained by the other four themes of geography interacting to give significance to a particular location. The significance of a location can change over time. Here's one example, picture Oklahoma. How did picture change over time? Can you think of other examples? Type them in the chat. So yeah, in case you're not familiar with Pitcher, um, oh, here's someone. Pitcher has been basically abandoned. Yeah, following the tornado. Yep, yep. Yeah, so just uh, some example, some more information about Pitcher. It was incorporated in March, 1918, had a population of almost 10,000 in 1920 at the height of mining. More than 50% of the lead and zinc metal consumed in World War I came from Pitcher. So in the following years, Pitcher declined as it could not attract new industry. When lead and zinc mining finally stopped in 1967, pumping water out of the mines ceased and they began to fill with water accumulating contaminated mine water underground. This contaminated water eventually rose to the surface. In 1983, Pitcher became part of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency Superfund site program and remains the number one Superfund site in America. In recent history, the F4 tornado swept through the town in 2008 and damaged many of the remaining houses. Uh, finally, in 2009, the pitcher's incorporated status was canceled. So um, we'll move on to the next theme. What do you think makes a place a place? What makes one place different from another? Type your answer in the chat and feel free to guess. There's not, not a wrong answer. We're just uh, wanting to have a discussion about this. So don't, don't feel um, intimidated. Culture and resources. Yep, yeah, that's good. Anyone else? People, yep. People that live there, yep. Landmarks, resources, yeah. Yeah, these are all great answers. So what's the difference between place and location? Does anyone have a guess? Type your answer in the chat if you have a guess. So while you're thinking about that, location tells us where and place tells us what is there. So places have physical and human characteristics. Uh, we've already been listing some of the physical and human characteristics. So uh, we've got landscapes, population, people, physical geography, culture, resources, yeah, yeah, these are all really good. So um, the physical characteristics could be landforms, climate, soils, vegetation, wildlife. Uh, the human characteristics could be religion, language, population, settlement patterns, and economic activities. So here's a place. Name some of the physical and human characteristics you notice. Type your answer in the chat. Yep, mountain, water, yep, boats, yep. Yep, these are all good. Yep, buildings, 
Yeah, yeah. So some possible answers for physical characteristics could be coastal. Uh, looks like the terrain is maybe somewhat rugged. There are various forms of vegetation. We've got palm trees, other types of trees, overcast weather in this particular photo. Um, possible human characteristics. Uh, the presence of the structure here indicates some economic activity, past or present, and the presence of boats indicates economic activity. Um, but knowing this place's location might tell us more about the human characteristics. So does anyone know where this is located? Take a guess. Yep. All right. So this is Avalon, California on Catalina Island. So can anyone tell me the absolute or relative location of Avalon? You can Google this one if you want. Yep. West of LA. Yep. So the absolute location is 33 degrees north, 118 degrees west. Um, relative location could be in a lot of different terms. Um, you could say it's on the southeast side of the Catalina Island or about 30 miles south of Long Beach. Yeah, very good. So the next theme is human environment interaction. A given place has distinct advantages and disadvantages to being habitable for humans. This thing describes how humans behave according to these advantages and disadvantages. So what do you think are some possible advantages or disadvantages of a particular place? Type your answer in the chat. Climate, yep. Population density, yeah. Yep, water, climate, farmland, yep. Lack of resources, natural disasters. Yeah, so yeah, some Lots of good answers here. Um, some advantages could be natural resources, availability of land, favorable conditions for agriculture. Some disadvantages could be a limited supply of natural resources. It could be an area prone to natural hazards, uh, undesirable weather conditions. Um, related to this theme, people apply technology according to these advantages and disadvantages to modify the environment. These modifications can take place in the form of agriculture, industry, settlement patterns, or other human activities. Of course, the application of technology can also lead to its own advantages or disadvantages, such as air, water, noise, or light pollution. So one example of human environment interaction is the onset of earthquakes in Oklahoma. Oklahoma's oil and gas resources have driven the state's economic development for over a century. However, the underground wastewater injection from oil and gas production has been linked to increased seismic activity, which has resulted in property damage for many Oklahomans. Can you think of any other examples? Type them in the chat. Yep, air, water, pollution, yep. If it helps to think about our example of picture, what were some uh, what were some human environment interactions going on there? Mining, yep. Yeah. Yep, forest clearing. Water contamination, yep. yep. 
All right, so while you're thinking about that, I'm going to move on to the next theme. So the next theme I'm going to discuss is that of regions. How would you define a region? Type your answer in the chat. And while you're thinking about that, here's a short video clip you might enjoy. It's cool that you like the Southwest. It's one of my favorite regions. It's one of my favorite regions. Did I just sound totally lame? Huh. It sounded good. I love the desert. It's one of my favorite ecosystems. All right, so what's your favorite region? Type your answer in the chat. All right, so, so we got some answers rolling in for the region. So a location that shares climate or culture, area with similar characteristics. Yep, yeah, those are all really good. So I'm sure we're all somewhat familiar with the regions that make up the United States, but what other types of regions can you think of? What makes one region different from another? Uh, type what you think in the chat. Yeah, we've got some good answers coming in. High Plains, Pacific Northwest. Yeah, so weather, vegetation, that would be something that makes a region different from another. Yep. Population density, norms, yeah. These would all be things that define a particular region. So yeah, simply put, a region is an area with common features. A region can, de can be defined by physical features such as forests, wildlife, climate, or human features such as government, language, or religion. Regions help us understand and organize our planet's characteristics spatially. The boundaries of a region are not always clearly defined as what's pictured here on this map. So other than the Southwest as pictured here, what other regions would Oklahoma be a part of? Type your answer in the chat. And while you're thinking about that, uh, what types of regions exist within Oklahoma? You can type that in the chat as well. Yep, Midwest. There's certainly a lot of debate about which region Oklahoma is actually in. Um, I think it kind of boils down to where you are in Oklahoma. So a lot of people consider the Tulsa area to be more of the Midwest, whereas the Panhandle would be more of the Southwest kind of region. Yep, these are good. Tornado Alley, Bible Belt, yeah, Prairie, Grassland, yeah. So are all really good answers. Oh yeah, urban, rural, yeah, definitely. Yeah, very good. All right, so um, if you want a more in-depth discussion of regions, uh, I'm going to share a lesson with you that you can look at later. It's on the OKAGE website right now. I'm just gonna drop it in the chat. So feel free to look at that whenever you have a chance. So now we're going to go on to the final theme, which is movement. So regions and places are connected by movement or human interaction, such as communication, which could entail the exchange of ideas, information, or customs. Movement can also be physical. Examples of physical movement would be weather patterns, water flow, ocean currents, wind patterns. Uh, so what are some reasons for human movement? Type them in the chat. So what would be a reason that someone may choose to move? Jobs, yep. 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 Climate change, disaster, yep. War, economic opportunity. So yeah, while you're kind of thinking about that, people move out of curiosity for economic reasons, a response to an environmental change, or in some cases because they're being forced out of a particular place. So related to the theme of movement, I wanna briefly go over push and pull factors. 
Can anyone tell me what a push and pull factor would be as they relate to movement? Type your answer in the chat. Feel free to guess if you're not sure. Yep, push, something that pushes you to move. Yep, pull would be jobs, yep. Yeah. Yeah, so simply put, a push factor would be something driving you away from a particular place, and a pull factor is something drawing you into a particular place. So let's go back to some of the reasons for movement that you identified. Which ones are push factors? Which ones are pull factors? So you guys have already identified a lot of these. So a pull factor would be jobs. A push factor would be drought. Yeah, so these are all really good. Yep. Yeah, things that repel you from a place. Uh, housing, struggling schools. Pull is the promise of better jobs and schools, neighborhoods, yeah. So we also have a lesson specifically on push and pull factors that you can look at if you want more information about that. I'm dropping that in the chat as well. All right, so how's everyone doing? Does anyone have any questions or comments before we go on to the next part? Uh, feel free to type anything in the chat that you want me to address. I'll give you guys a couple minutes if you've got something that you want to um, ask or comment on. All right, I don't see anything coming in, so I think we're just going to keep going. So now that we've covered the basics of the five themes of geography, I'm going to briefly discuss the rise of the Greenwood District in Tulsa, Oklahoma through a geographic lens. So this is not meant to be an exhaustive historical account. In fact, it will be quite general, but the purpose is to start a dialogue about the historical geography of the Greenwood District and to provide you with some tools that you can use to analyze the historical significance of other places or events. So why Tulsa? Let's take a closer look. First of all, where is Tulsa? What is Tulsa's absolute location? You can use Google for this one. What about Tulsa's relative location? Type your answer in the chat. So the absolute location is 36 degrees north, 95 degrees west. Um, for relative location, there's lots of different examples. Um, could be 106 miles northeast of Oklahoma City, lowest point to cross the Arkansas River. Yep. Yep, northeast of Oklahoma City. Yep. Yeah, these are good. Yep. All right, next, let's think about Tulsa as a place. Pictured here is Tulsa in the year 1918. What do you notice about this photo? What do you think were some of the factors that led to the city's development during the years leading up to this photo? Type your answer in the chat. So while you're thinking about that, remember location tells us where and place tells us what is there. Recall that a place is made up of both human and physical characteristics. What are some of the human and physical characteristics of 1918 Tulsa pictured here? What is not pictured? What questions do you have about this photo, if any? So yeah, I got a lot of good answers rolling in already. So the river, discovery of oil, 
grid pattern. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, built near the river for easier transportation of goods. Yep. So pictured here is the Glen Pool oil field in the 1920s near Tulsa. Starting in 1901 and for the next three decades, Tulsa was known as the oil capital of the world. So we know the oil resource is one of the underlying physical characteristics defining this place. The following year in 1902, Glen Pool made Oklahoma a national leader in oil production. Subsequently, several major energy companies tied the state to their major oil transmission pipelines. Additionally, Oklahoma's petroleum deposits lie within a larger reserve called the Mid-Continent Region, an area that also encompasses Kansas, Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, and New Mexico. So based on this information, identify one or more of the five themes of geography that apply and explain your answer. So I really like this comment in the chat saying built near the river for easier transportation of goods because that ties in to human environment interaction and movement because you've got the transportation aspect. Yeah. So while you're thinking about that, um, I'll just kind of give you my answer and then, uh, but please continue to type anything else you think of in the chat. So I think this gives way to three other themes of geography, human environment interaction, regions, and movement. So as we talked about previously, one of Oklahoma's primary economic activities is the production of oil. So technology was developed and used to obtain, refine, and distribute this resource. The development and use of technology to obtain this resource would be an example of human environment interaction, while the distribution and subsequent private and commercial use of this resource would be an example of movement. So not only is the resources, resource itself moving, but it's enabling other forms of transportation to develop. Also, Oklahoma's oil resource ties the state to a larger region, which is the mid-continent region. So would Tulsa's oil resource be considered a push factor or a pull factor? Feel free to drop that in the chat. Yep, yep, it's an easy one. Yep, wasn't a trick question. You guys are doing really well. Yep, yeah, very good. So pictured here is an example of movement created by the Oklahoma uh, oil industry. What other themes of geography do you see in this photo? Type your answer in the chat. Yep. Yep, movement. Yep, human environment interaction. Yep. Place, yeah. Yeah. So one thing I notice here is um, the pollution. So we've got some human inter environment interaction going on there, uh, which is uh, a negative aspect of this development. Yeah. All right, so now that we've thought about Tulsa, Oklahoma as a place, let's go over some of the factors that led to the rise of the Greenwood District in Tulsa, Oklahoma. So here's a map that shows the Greenwood District in 1921. According to the National Park Service, the district contained 191 businesses, including doctor's offices, dentists, lawyer's offices. Uh, residents in this district had access to a library, schools, a hospital, uh, the Tulsa Public Health Service prior to the massacre in 1921. According to the Oklahoma Historical Society, the Greenwood District also contained grocery stores, movie theaters, shoe shine shops, and more. 
the amenities of the Greenwood District rivaled those of the surrounding white neighborhoods, contributing to increased socioeconomic tensions in the Tulsa area. So how did this come to be? We'll use the five themes of geography to understand the beginnings of Greenwood. So a combination of push and pull factors led to the exodus of African Americans into other states. This is referred to as the Great Migration, which took place in several waves over several decades in the early 1900s. Many sources attribute negative impacts of bull weevils and floods upon cotton crops in the South as a main push factor. However, this association is not particularly straightforward as declines in cotton yields did not necessarily increase rates of migration of African Americans to other states in a clear cause and effect way. Many sources also attribute the Jim Crow laws and severe discrimination faced by African Americans in the South as a primary push factor. Though this was, of course, a contributing factor, it was not found to be the main one, statistically speaking, and during some of the years of the Great Migration. So uh, you can see the source for more information. I'm going to drop it in the chat um, in case you want to read more about this. So let me get that in the chat for you. So what did contribute significantly to the Great Migration? In short, it was the considerable decrease in European immigrants during World War I. This opened up many industrial jobs to African Americans that were previously filled with immigrant workers. During the years of 1910 to 1914, the average number of immigrants was around 750,000 per year. In 1915, this fell to 123,000, then to an average of 111,000 per year from 1915 to 1919. But note that this is an average and that levels of immigration were very low during the years of 1918 and 1919. So which of the five themes of geography do you notice in this account of the Great Migration? Type your answer in the chat. Movement, yeah. Yep. Yeah, so movement would be the most obvious one, um, as denoted by the title itself, the Great Migration. We've also got some other geographic themes going on here. So within the South, we have the region of the Cotton Belt. Human environment interaction is also going on. In the South, as plantation owners grapple with decreased cotton yields due to bull weevils and floods. Uh, we also have movement of people and resources, which is happening during World War I. African Americans from the South were seeking economic opportunities in other states. As an example of the movement of resources, zinc and lead from Pitcher, Oklahoma, were being used for World War I efforts. So you're probably wondering why these maps aren't showing it, an influx of African Americans into the Tulsa area during the first Great Migration. So what's going on here? And uh, Professor Lonsena um, already touched on this in his talk, but feel free to type in the chat like what you think is going on. Any guesses? So while you're thinking about that, I'll go into the next slide. So after the Civil War and prior to what is considered the official start of the Great Migration, present day Oklahoma was already attracting African Americans, whether they were seeking refuge from discrimination in the South or to take advantage of economic opportunities. Furthermore, many African Americans had already come to present day Oklahoma as slaves traveling with the five tribes on the Trail of Tears as a result of the Indian Removal Act of 1830. After emancipation, African Americans could now own land. From 1865 to 1920, African Americans created more than 50 identifiable towns and settlements. Some did not last long, while some were still existing at the beginning of the 21st century. 
All black towns grew in Indian territory after the Civil War when former slaves of the five tribes settled together for mutual protection and economic security. So which of the five themes of geography do you notice here? Type your answer in the chat. Yep, location, yep. Place, yep. Yeah. So while you're thinking about that, um, movement is an obvious theme here. As African Americans traveled from the South to present day Oklahoma, Looking at the map, you can also see a fairly well-defined region of all black towns within Oklahoma. It's uh, strongly clustered right around the northeastern portion of Oklahoma. Human environment interaction could also be argued as one of the reasons for the passing of the Indian Removal Act because white settlers wanted to grow cotton in the south. Human environment interaction is also occurring in Oklahoma during this time in the form of agriculture and the oil industries. Place is also a theme due to the settlement patterns found in this map. So during this time characterized by the rise of all black towns in Oklahoma, specifically in 1893, a man named O.W. Gurley, who was born to freed slaves in Alabama, claimed a land in present day Perry, Oklahoma, during the Cherokee outlet opening, which is pictured here. A short time later, in 1905, Gurley sold his land in Perry and moved to Tulsa, seeking opportunity in Tulsa's booming oil industry. Which of the five themes do you notice here? Movement, yep. You guys are experts now. Yep. Yep, human environment interaction. Yep. Yeah, so movement would be the obvious one because we've got people moving from one place to another. Human environment interaction would also be a theme uh, due to the rising oil industry. Yep. So O.W. Gurley and another man by the name of J.B. Stratford each played major roles in the early development of the Greenwood District, along with others. Stratford came to Tulsa in 1899 and worked with Gurley after his purchase of 40 acres of land in the Greenwood District. Gurley built a rooming house near the railroad tracks and later built other structures and residences. Knowing that others like himself would soon come to Tulsa, he subdivided his land into residential and commercial sectors. By 1913, many more businesses were located in the Greenwood district, including law offices, doctor's offices, churches, restaurants, the Dreamland Theater, grocery stores, the Stratford Hotel, haberdasheries, drugstores, cafes, barbershops, beauty salons. Uh, pictured here is the Greenwood District around the year 1917. As we know, social tensions increased with the rise and success of Greenwood in the segregated and increasingly racially unstable climate in Oklahoma following statehood, ultimately leading to the events that took place on May 31st, 1921 and June 1st, 1921. So which of the five themes do you notice here? What about push and pull factors? Type your answer in the chat. So while you're thinking about that, um, place is a prominent theme here. Greenwood was truly a place like no other with its thriving businesses and community. This place came to be as a result of human environment interaction, primarily from the oil industry and following development of residential and commercial structures. Additionally, this place we know was located within the broader mid-continent oil region. Movement is also a theme as its population grew and Greenwood's proximity to rail would contribute to access to transportation. Not only would the oil industry be a pull factor for those who are directly employed, but this also gave way to the rise of secondary industries in the area, 
so which would be doctors offices other businesses schools and entertainment yep yeah lots of good answers coming in the chat as well job opportunities growing economy yeah very good all right so how are we doing now I feel like this is me explaining how the five themes of geography can be used to explain history. Is anyone else feeling this degree of, um, I don't know, I don't want to say confusion, but just like having to connect to all these different aspects um, can sometimes be a challenge. So I'm curious if anyone else is kind of feeling this way or not. Yep. Yep. Scott Green says this is geography. Everything is connected to everything else. Yep. All right. So now I'm going to open it up to you guys. Um, what other history can you analyze using the five themes of geography? Type your answer in the chat. Yep. World War II. Yeah. Civil War. Westward migration. Yep. Depre Great Depression. Yeah. Dust Bowl. Yep. The current election. Yeah, these are all really good. Yeah. All right, so that's all I have for you tonight. Um, does anyone have any questions or comments? Uh, feel free to type them in the chat or unmute yourself if you want to share anything. And I'm gonna take off my screen share. Um, so as I mentioned before, the standards are after this slide, so you'll have access to all of that as soon as, whoops, as soon as I have this uploaded to the website, so. Just be on the lookout for that. Um, so I wondered um, if no one has um, any questions just yet, I wondered if Professor Lonsena could uh, jump in and kind of link my talk to his. If there's any, if there are any comments you have or any questions or concerns that you may want to address, either for me or to the whole group. Oh, I have no concerns whatsoever. That was fantastic. And, um, you know, I'm a historian and a, and a, and a literature professor. So um, though geography fascinates me and, and informs how I see, I, I don't know the, the science of it like you all do. So that was, um, I really enjoyed that. I really learned uh, quite a few things. Um, I think it is, you know of interesting to note which you did um how number one this idea of movement that you know that Gurley moved from alabama he that ex Gurley's people were actually a part of the land run which i don't think many people um realized that there were many black folks not a lot but more than you'd think involved in the land run um and which is a fascinating sort of history in and of itself, but that Gurley's folks, uh, Gurley would 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 stake a claim and what in Perry, um, and and find wealth there, and then move to Tulsa and then share that wealth. I think is a, again an important uh, an important story um, that is not um, shared as often as it should be, um, and. It's fascinating to me again that those intersections between those five aspects or those five um, elements of geography and thinking about it in terms from the historian's lens. Because you cannot, as Scott said, they're all interconnected. You can't separate them. It's how, uh, it's the ways in which they um, inform what is or what, be, or what, what, what evolves, right? What manifests. And, um, and it's very fascinating to me. So I really appreciate um, what you shared and I'm looking forward to um, 
to getting a copy of it and um, and as, and Taylor's presentation as well and spending some more time with um, with the the ideas that you two have presented. Um, it's good stuff. Yeah, thank you. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Uh, feel free to type them in the chat if you think of anything. And uh, if you have a question that you would like to frame uh, to not just me, but to Professor Lonsena or Taylor, feel free to do that as well. And then we can all three uh, try to answer it. So uh, Scott has a question. Um, he's curious if any teachers can immediately think of how to develop a lesson plan on any of these topics. Yeah, that's a good one. So if you have any ideas, uh, feel free to type those in the chat and we can look at those. So one of the things that I was kind of thinking about whenever I was developing this talk was um, the Osage murders and how we might apply geography to that history. I have a lot of similar things kind of going on under the surface there. Yeah, that's a great idea. That's a great point. Um, and even the um, how the black towns came together, we both, uh, Becca, we both touched on that, but from a um, from a real sort of specific ge uh, geography lens to think about how um, how the black towns evolved um, would be very interesting. Um, as well, you reference sort of they're in a cluster in the northeast quadrant. What are the factors behind that, um, and how um, is it is are the uh, is the the proximity of so many in the northeastern part of the state driven by safety or opportunity or what? So, um, and and folks just moving there because black folks were already there, you know, in that area. So that's a, that would be a very interesting sort of study as well. Yeah. Uh, so we had a question come in uh, from Darren saying, I heard some talk of African Americans originally attempting to organize Oklahoma as a state. Is there any research on that? And yes, I think I remember reading that in my research that um, there was a really strong push to establish Oklahoma as an all black state. But um, I'm not the absolute expert on that. So Professor Lansana, I would love for you to also answer that question. Yeah, Darren, I referenced this earlier in, in my talk, so, but I'm happy to share it again. Yeah, a man named Edwin McCabe, who was a, a, a Kansas politician uh, who moved to Oklahoma, um, primarily to establish Oklahoma as an all black state. So he started with um, purchasing the land that we know as Langston, uh, Oklahoma, and then building Langston A&M, which is now Langston University on that land. Um, and he actually engaged in not only boostering, not only um, a, a, a massive campaign, particularly to blacks in the South to, hey, move to Oklahoma, but he also at the same time was petitioning the federal government and went to DC on two occasions and spoke with federal officials about uh, making Oklahoma an all black state. Um, and the pushback from not only white folks um, in Oklahoma, but Native American indigenous folks about this idea was too much for um, to, to overcome. And so the federal government ultimately denied um, his, his, his petitions, but he made a good, solid, concerted effort um, to, to do so. And I often ask my students um, what they think 
would have happened if that had been green lighted, if Oklahoma had been the place where, I mean, I think it's impossible to say all black folks, but an overwhelming majority of black folks um, in 1890 to 1910 um, migrated to this place. Um, how that would have changed everything, how would that have changed the history um, of this area and really of the country? Would um, Black folks have been able to um, maintain um, the boom from oil and other resources? Would they have been allowed to do that independently? Um, what about the technology or the science involved in getting oil from, you know, below the earth into um, and just something that could be, you know, turned into petroleum and used for, for energy and such. I mean, there are a lot of ifs. Um, would, there, would it have been the greatest sports juggernaut ever? Who knows? Um, but it was shut down primarily by the pushback um, from, from white Oklahomans and actually from, um, from the five tribes as well. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for answering that question. I knew you would have a much more eloquent answer than I did. Uh, so we also had some other good thoughts coming in the chat. Um, so uh, KWL chart, what do you want to know? Uh, what do you know and what have you learned? So that would be a great way to kind of frame this kind of discussion in the classroom. Um, someone else says a choice board letting students choose topics, the Tulsa race massacre, 9-11, OKC bombing. Um, group choice board where students do research and present the topics. Yep, that's good. Yeah, a lot of good ideas here. Yeah. So does anyone have any final comments or questions before I do the door prize drawing and uh, distribute the evaluation forms? I've got a couple more minutes for questions in case anyone thinks of anything. I want to speak to Amber's idea. That's a really good idea. Um, and one of the things that I, I, I've taught quite, quite a bit is persona. Um, as, a, as a poet, um, I believe in the power of persona um, and actually wrote um, my second book was published. My second book is called They Shall Run Harriet Tubman Poems. And the idea for that book was actually born in an eighth grade classroom on the south side of Chicago. Um, finding ways to creatively to teach history to eighth graders who'd rather do anything other than teach uh, learn history, and so we made Harriet Tubman, you know, flesh and blood and woman and black, and took her off the wall in February and made her breathing, um, and then gave her voice, um, and that ended up being my graduate thesis. So I like that idea a great deal because there's a, a sense of it's localizing localizing agency by um, you are now uh, writing in the voice of, you are now in the skin of a, um, a white man who's been recently deputized, who um, has very little to nothing in, but is, but except for a jealousy and a, an envy uh, and a racist hatred or um, a young black woman uh, growing up in Greenwood. So, um, that's a really great exercise, and there's there's some there's great empathy, uh, in my opinion, that is experienced from writing in persona, whether those are poems um, or just you know persona fiction, persona uh, nonfiction, but just wearing another skin, um, I think is a very powerful teaching tool. So thank you for that. All right. Well, I think we'll go on to the distribution of the evaluation form. So let me go ahead and drop that link in the chat for you guys. Give me just a second and I'll get that for you. So, all right. So there's the evaluation form. It's just a Google form for you guys. So, um, if you're, um, every, everyone who participated today is eligible to receive a PD certificate and a $25 stipend. Uh, the instructions for obtaining your certificate and stipend are in the evaluation form. 
so you've got the link to the evaluation form. Uh, if you're interested in developing a lesson plan based on what you've learned in this workshop, you'll be eligible to receive an additional $25. So you can email me at okage at ou.edu for further instructions or if you have questions about that, and I'll drop that in the chat as well. So any questions at all um, about anything relating to the stipends, evaluation, um, the recordings later on, uh, just send me an email at okj.ou.edu and I will get back to you as soon as I can.